programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you. And by The Nature Conservancy, protecting the beautiful lands and waters you love. From your cold, clear rivers to your favorite outdoor getaways, The Nature Conservancy works to keep Montana a place where both nature and people can thrive. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. Now, good evening, folks. Welcome to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios in KUSM on the beautiful campus of Montana State University, and also our homes and offices located around various locations here in the beautiful state of Montana. I'm Jack Rieselman. I'll be your host tonight. You know the routine. You provide the questions. We try to provide the answers and the commentary. It's pretty simple. You call in the questions, the phone number will be on the screen, and Nancy Blake and I believe Bruce Lobo will be taking your questions tonight. They forward those questions to me through technology to this little computer that's sitting in front of me. Pretty simple. Tonight we have a really different type of program. It should be a lot of fun. I know I'm gonna learn a lot. We have the president of the Montana Grape and Winery Association as our special guest. And along with that, we have a couple new people or people that are on, not on often. So I'll introduce everybody now and then we'll go back to Bob Thayden, our guest, and have him tell us a little bit about the wine industry in the state of Montana and his individual operation. Before we get there, sitting in the studio with me, is Mary Burroughs. Mary is Associate Director of the Ag Experiment Station now. She also is part-time extension plant pathology. So if you have disease questions, good chance to ask them this evening. Our special guest, Bob Thayden. Bob, welcome to Montana Ag Live. Bob is, along with his wife, Marilyn, owner and operator of the Tongue River Winery in Miles City, Montana. It's a place that you probably don't consider to be a winery area or a grape growing area, but Bob can tell you he does a great job out there and he'll talk about it in a few moments. Also joining us tonight is Stephen Van Tassel. Stephen's been on before. He's the vertebrate pest specialist with the Montana Department of Agriculture. If you got questions about voles, mice, anything with four legs that causes you problems, here's your chance to get the answer. Somebody new tonight, Abby Saeed. Abby is our new extension horticulturalist just on board a few months, very knowledgeable. We're happy to have her here. And I tell you what, you'll see a lot more of her on Montana Ag Live in future years and months. So with that, Bob, tell us a little bit about the Grape and Wine Association and your winery out at Mile City. I'll try again. Um, the Montana Association, uh, Grape and Winery Association started about six years ago. It was the second attempt by winemakers in Montana to create an organization. The first attempt was um, back in the late 90s, if I understand correctly. Um, but six years ago, uh, uh, due to uh, the um, uh, extension agent up in the Flathead Lake area, uh, a group of people started getting together to talk about forming an association. And I heard about this and contacted Pat McGlynn. And um, I think because I was the only person in the eastern part of the state, they uh, uh, added me to their discussion uh, just so we wouldn't feel left out over here in eastern Montana. Um, I helped form the board and uh, have been on the board of directors since then um, and 
this spring became the president, uh, following Rich Torquemada, uh, who was president the last three years. Um, I started making wine 54 years ago when I was a college student. It was legal at age 18 <laughs> back then. Um, and now I'm 72, so I've been doing this as an amateur for uh, about 40 some years and now as a professional for the last 10. Uh, there are about uh, 15 active wineries in Montana that, that crush and ferment fruit into wine. Um, there are a half dozen more that are uh, either just came out this year or, or will be coming out within the next year or so um, that maybe don't have wine on the market yet because their grapes are so newly planted and their wine has not had a chance to age yet. Uh, our winery, Tongue River Winery in Mile City, has been uh, open for 10 years. Our oldest grapes are about 16 years old. Uh, so that's a little bit of background here. My wife and I uh, own the uh, business. Our son worked with us until uh, this spring, uh, helped me build the winery building and um, uh, worked for 10 years uh, uh, with me in the vineyard and winery uh, for the last three years was our head winemaker. Uh, so now I'm doing that again as well. It's an interesting story, Bob. You know, there's been a lot of information that maybe Montana is not the greatest place to grow grapes, but obviously you do pretty well with them. How do you make them survive Montana's winter? I jokingly like to say to people that growing perennials of any sort is a little bit like courtship. If you don't do your homework and you don't take some time and you just make a sudden decision, um, it can end as badly growing perennials as it can getting married hastily. Uh, if you go down to the local box store without checking at all with your, uh, your local uh, uh, county agent or someone from the Grape and Wine Association uh, or someone from Montana State University, you may make some stupid mistakes. Uh, we mostly grow University of Minnesota hybrids. Let me tell you a little bit about those. Most of the people in Montana who know anything about wine immediately think of the European grape uh, species, Vitus vinifera. The problem with vinifera is that although it makes really nice wine, it's only hardy to about zero. Can you name any place in Montana that doesn't get colder than zero? Um, so what happens if you try to grow those grape, grape vines here is they freeze back to the ground and most of them are grafted. And so what comes up is the rootstock and you have lost uh, your variety. Uh, we're growing those European grapes that they grow on the West Coast, like Riesling, Cab, Merlot, Chardonnay, and so forth, crossed with Vitus riparia, mostly. The riparian grape is hardy to more than 50 degrees below zero. Every single wild grapevine out there is technically a different uh, variety. They're all seedlings. There may be a, a, a wild grape out there hardy to 60 below, and we just haven't found it yet. The crosses that the University of Minnesota have, have uh, put together are hardy anywhere from about 28 below down to about 40 below Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, mostly that's what we're growing. Cornell University started back in the 1880s and uh, changed to focusing on wine grapes in the 1940s. But they were willing to put names on grapes that are only hardy to about 15 below, which won't work in Montana. Uh, Minnesota is willing to put names on grapes that are hardy to the minus high 20s, minus 28, maybe minus 30. But that's really not good enough either. Uh, so 12 years ago, North Dakota State University in Fargo started a great germplasm or breeding program, and they aim at 40 below as a starting point. Uh, we have a replicated trial of five of the best NDSU grapes um, out of about 10,000 seedlings, two whites and three reds. Uh, they are, the whites especially, are proving up really nicely. Uh, our plants are five years old now, and uh, I know that NDSU is looking at those two whites as possible candidates uh, for uh, 
uh, naming and getting out there for uh, growers to use. But that process of patenting takes a number of years. So we're helping them prove up not only on uh, how well they'll grow, but also on uh, the quality of wine, disease resistance, and, and so forth. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to you. I've got a couple of questions that have come in. But meanwhile, uh, Abby, uh, we've had a lot of snow here in the Gallatin Valley, and this question came from Belgrade. Uh, their trees still had leaves on it and are drooping. They're afraid that the branches will break. Anything they should do about that? Yeah, so that's, um, this is uh, similar to what happened last fall, but um, this could be problematic for your trees. Um, one thing you can do is you can try and remove the snow from the branches that are drooping. Um, and so um, try and, and shake it off or take a broom from underneath and uh, try and brush as much of it off as you can so that it's not continuing to be under that weight of the snow. Because the leaves are still on there, that's creating more of a surface area so that snow will pile up. Um, and so it adds more, um, more weight to that. So try, try and shake off some of the snow. If you're really worried about a tree, you can also stake it up um, using stakes that will reach those uh, branches that might be drooping. Make sure you don't damage the roots when you put the stakes in, um, but that can also help provide that structural support to your trees. Thank you. A uh, question for Stephen. Uh, came in from Haver. This person uh, would like to know, are there any rodenticides that are safer than others for use in garages and even in their homes? Um, I guess they're basically talking about mice poisons sure yeah there would be and that would be any any of the first generation anticoagulants would be safer no no no, no toxicant is safe so we want to make sure that gets out there so you're looking for active ingredients warfarin so you want to read the small print in those labels and i'm sorry you have to kind of get some magnifying glasses sometimes but there's there's three first generation anticoagulants and those are warfarin chlorofacinone and difacinone, those are the three to look for if you want a safer uh, anticoagulant for controlling controlling mice. Of course, you can always go with traps, if that's certainly an option for you. Uh, just make sure you use a lot of them. Traps are like money, more is better. <laughs> so Steve, Stephen, have you uh, ever tried those salt-based baits? Salt-based baits? I'm yeah. not familiar with, with okay. that. Okay, no. we, we bought some at, at the store and it seemed to help, but I Yeah, I'd be in interested in learning, learning about a, a salt bait. So uh, how would it work? How it, is it, supposed it was to some sort of um, pellet that had salt and was supposed to, if they didn't have access to water, it would dehydrate them. Interesting. Hmm. No, I would, uh, I, I would have my, my doubts about that about that, but I would be happy to look into it more. So I'll have to uh, make a note of that. Yeah. Well, you know, salt well, based. Well, I've got you up. Bob, do you have vole problems in your vineyard on Miles City? Probably not. You probably don't have enough snow cover, but are voles a problem in other areas of Montana on grapes where we have uh, extended snow cover? There are people who've reported that problem. Uh, you're right. We don't have enough snow cover here usually. Um, we're more likely to have problems with cottontail rabbits. Um, you know, if they can find a place to nest, they'll chew on the base of the, of the uh, uh, vines um, with cherry bushes. They'll chew on the trunks of the cherry bushes and things like that as well. Uh, we have a number of cats around, and that helps a lot with all of those uh, four-legged critters. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary, another question from Haver. Um, they're curious, is most of the winter wheat in the ground? And if so, will the snow hurt it or is the condition still gonna be pretty good? I, I think growers had good opportunity to get their winter wheat in. Um, most all of it's in and was in timely. It, it didn't have water for a little while, <laughs> um, but it got, just got covered with snow, a nice blanket and should be in really good shape. You know, I've been around the state a little bit. Actually, Bob, I've been out in Eastern Montana a couple of times this fall chasing pheasants and somebody called in last week and wanted to know how we did. And I will say the pheasant numbers are up and we did quite well out there. But anyway, the winter wheat I've seen it looks pretty good. I'm surprised it's as green as it is. It won't be now. It's a hardy plant. It is a hardy <laughs> plant. Okay, uh, Bob from Bozeman. 
Uh, they've read that roughly 98% of the wine uh, sold in Montana comes from Washington, Oregon, and California. How would you compete against uh, massive wine influxes like that? Well, that's, that's a really important question. Um, uh, before I answer that, I just want to point to the picture. Uh, you may have gotten some contacts from a number of viewers a couple months ago when one of your guests suggested that wine would not grow in Montana. Um, and we wanted to enter your picture contest, but I forgot to do it uh, just to demonstrate that it does grow. This is part of a harvest we did a couple of years ago of grapes from our place in, in my background picture there. Um, so uh, just to hammer that point home, uh, uh, yes, wine grapes will grow in Montana. Um, the, uh, the big issue for people who are growing grapes in Montana is one of name recognition. If a customer goes to the, uh, the grocery store and, or the, or the, the uh, liquor store and wants to buy a white wine, uh, it may well be that the only white wine they're really familiar with is Pinot Gris and Chardonnay, maybe Sauvignon Blanc. And then they'll see a bottle of wine from Tongue River Winery that says Frontenac Gris on it. Uh, or they'll see a St. Pepin, or they'll see a La Crescent. And they'll be standing there looking at them and thinking to themselves, I've never heard of this wine before. No, I think I'll stick with what I know. I'll get some Pinot Gris. Um, so we have a name recognition problem, and we're hoping that we can uh, uh, get the legislature to understand the importance of changing the rules a little bit on how we can sell our wines so that we can create more opportunities for people to taste our wines so they have a better uh, understanding of what Montana wines are like. We're a very new industry relative to European grapes, which have been around for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Um, Pinot, uh, Pinot Noir has certainly been around uh, for three or 400 years at least, but its grandson, Marquette, uh, released by the University of Minnesota, was only released in 2006. So it's only 14 years old. There's a lot we don't know about how to make the best wine out of it yet because it's such a new grape, uh, but it has the capacity to make really excellent wine. Um, there, you know, especially the younger wine drinkers, the millennials, the X generation, the Y generation coming up um, are far more interested in trying new wines, different wines. Uh, uh, so they're more likely to go to boutique wineries and and try something different than older established wine drinkers who have deeply entrenched habits about what they like. Uh, so uh, tasting rooms are absolutely important to give people a chance to try them so they can see what our wines are like. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question here that came in um, through Facebook. And this one, are there any registered rodenticides for control of pack rots in outbuildings? That comes from Livingston. Uh, actually, we just we just got some registered. Before previously, uh, there were no toxicants registered for the control of the bushy tailwood rat, commonly called the pack rat. So we have two. We're expecting more to be added soon. But that would be from Leafatech. That's the name of the manufacturer, Leafatech. And the two products are called Fast Draw 40 and Revolver 40. So a little gun motif there. Uh, Fast Draw 40 and Revolver 40, both are labeled for the control of pack rat uh, within 100 feet of a structure. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, Mary uh, from Missoula. This person has peach leaf curl. And I assume they're on peaches, but we do get leaf curl on some other plants. Uh, he has tried a copper treatment last spring and it didn't work. Any suggestions? Uh, copper probably needs to be reapplied. So I think dormant. Yeah, um, they might want to call Eva at the diagnostic lab, 994-5150, and she might know quite a bit more than I do. Okay. I have a couple interesting questions uh, for... Um, Bob, but before we go there, a Kalispell caller has several cherry trees that did not go dormant before the storm. The leaves have frozen after the recent cold and snow. Should he expect his trees to be damaged? I'll send that to Saeed, Abby. Um, 
it is possible for damage to occur. So um, if that snow is piling up on top of those frozen leaves, um, I would recommend trying to, um, you know, get most of it off. Um, but it, it will be difficult to tell what happens to those trees over the course of the winter until the spring. There's not very much else um, you can do at this time. Uh, one thing that they can do if they are younger cherry trees is to use a tree wrap on the base, on the trunk, um, to prevent sun scald and the damage associated with that. Um, but other than that, try and get that um, snow off of the trees as best as you can and um, keep an eye on them in the early spring. Okay, thank you. Uh, two questions, one from Bozeman, and let me state this one, then I'll go to the second one. How many wineries are in the state and can we buy them at stores? The other similar question comes from Manhattan. And this person's goal is to visit and sample all of Montana's nearly 100 craft breweries. After that, he's decided he'd like to visit all of the wineries and sample the wines throughout the state. So, Bob, how many wineries are in the state and how spread out are they? Well, not near as many as there are breweries. Um, Montana, interestingly, has a record, uh, the last I heard, um, of having the greatest number of breweries and distilleries per capita of any state in the union. North Dakota has the, the, the award for the highest consumption of alcohol per capita in, in the union, probably mostly whiskey and beer, but uh, that's, that's just a guess. In Montana, we have um, uh, about 15 active wineries that are actually fermenting and processing uh, fruit. Um, there are half a dozen to maybe 10 more that are bringing in all of their wine from out of state already fermented and basically just bottling and labeling it here. Um, so that's a question that I would encourage you to ask if you are planning on visiting a winery and find out if they're actually making Montana wine or if they're bringing in California, Washington, Oregon wine and, and simply labeling it here. Um, most of the wineries in Montana are in the northwest corner. Uh, there are uh, uh, two or three on the Flathead that are already licensed. There's a new winery, um, Watchdog Winery, uh, at Dixon, Montana. Um, there are, uh, there's a, a new winery up in the Kalispell area. Uh, there are two or three wineries in the Bitterroot Valley. Um, Andy Sponsler's winery, a 10 spoon winery in Missoula. Um, so most of them are out uh, in the northwestern corner. Uh, however, there are some new vineyards um, near the Billings area. There's one in, in Laurel that is thinking about opening a winery in a couple of years. Uh, there's one uh, in the Warden area uh, that is at least toying with the idea. Um, it, it turns out that probably more of the wineries uh, and vineyards and orchards are in the northwest corner because they have milder winters. But the one thing they don't have is a lot of summer heat. Um, growers use a concept called growing degree days, which basically is the average amount of heat above 50 degrees um, throughout the growing period of the summer, uh, usually counted from about April 1st through the 1st of October. And uh, 50 degrees because below 50 degrees, the plant is green and sitting there, but not really doing very much. Above 50 degrees, there's a lot of photosynthesis happening and, and growth going on and so forth. So 50 degrees for grapes and corn and some other commodities is considered pretty uh, standard. Around the flathead, um, and Bitterroot area, uh, they average somewhere between 1,800 to maybe 2,000, 2,100 growing degree days. Mile City and Forsyth are closer to 26 to 2,800 growing degree days. Um, so in a nutshell, what that means is that we receive 40 to 50% more heat in the summer and more sunny days than they do in the Northwest. So if we grow varieties that can make it through the winter, we can get them riper more easily in this corner than anywhere else in Montana, um, which is why we think that if we do everything right, and if we know how to make good wine, 
we should be able to make better wine in Miles City than anywhere up in the Northwest, simply because we can get the grapes riper. Okay, thank you. That's an interesting concept. A uh, question from Bozeman. This person has bad aphids on his plum tree. Can he treat it now or wait until spring? I'm not an entomologist, but I think he just had him treated the last couple of days. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I think they've been taken care of now. I, I'm sure that's right. Um, from Laurel and Abby, I have a couple questions here. I'm going to kind of combine them. We have one question. A person wants to know what the best seedless table grape is to grow in the state. And what is the best cold hardy grape variety to grow in the state right now for table grapes? Can you guys answer that, either Abby or Bob or both of you? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, Bob? You're yeah, the, the most reliable seedless table grape for our cold winters is Somerset Seedless. It's a very small grape. If you dry it, um, you'll, you'll get, in effect, uh, uh, dried currants. Uh, dried currants are not currants, they are small dried grapes. They're little raisins, if you will. Um, and it's hardy to about 28 below, maybe 25 below. That's by far the hardiest uh, of the seedless grapes uh, out there. Uh, another one that uh, if you're not quite so, so cold and you don't mind the seeds, if, if your temperature doesn't get below about 18 degrees, maybe 20 degrees uh, below zero, uh, Swenson Red is an absolutely wonderful, incredibly delicious, very productive grape. We bury the vines here every year so we can get the fruit. Um, and it's, it's just a really lovely grape. Okay. Uh, so Somerset Seedless is the best bet. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Stephen, this person uh, from the Gallon Valley here lost thousands of dollars worth of plants last year due to voles. And he's not the only person, or they're not the only person. A lot of people have serious vol problems. He's not seeing them this year. What's your prognostication, or what's your forecast for vol damage this year? Oh, I, I, I wish I had a forecast. So here's the problem with voles. Vol, vol populations spike sort of cyclically. Uh, when that happens, anybody knows, typically the theory is that if you have an early spring, early wet spring, the reproductive cycle starts early and then there's a lot. So let's talk about the control of, of voles. Uh, first thing is download my publication from the Montana Department of Ag website on voles. Just look up, go to the Montana Department of Ag, go to vertebrate pest and it's on my page. That'd be my first step. But in terms of control, if you had problems with voles in the past and you're trying to prevent them from happening for next spring, because most people, the damage is occurring, of course, in the winter under the snow, you want to control them now. So you want to look at the type of, uh, look at some toxicants perhaps, or start doing some heavy duty trapping right now so that you can knock that population down over the winter time. So population really declines over the winter so that there's even less come next spring. Uh, but in terms of, Predicting? Oh, it's anybody's guess. Okay. Uh, I have not seen as much vole damage this summer as I had the previous two summers, so they must be a little bit cyclical. It, it is cyclical, but weather, uh, but it's also a matter of toleration, too. So if, if there's a new food supply that they can hit, the populations can spike okay. dramatically because their reproductive rate's so high. All right. Thanks. Uh, comment. Uh, from Darby, uh, the caller suggested that someone should travel to all the Montana wineries, sample the wines, and write a book to help promote the industry. This gentleman from Manhattan might do that next year, but in the meantime, I might have to volunteer to do that. I that, think it's a great retirement I think it would be like a good job. <laughs> <laughs> it really would. Um, Bob, and this is kind of a tough question. Can you explain differences between the uh, grapes used for different types of wine for a specific example, Pinot Gris versus Chardonnay. It's just the varietals, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Pinot Gris is uh, a, a white grape. The Pinot cluster of grapes um, mutates, has color mutations that happen rather readily. Uh, so Pinot Gris was, was uh, one of those mutations. Pinot Blanc is another mutation. The original Pinot was Pinot Noir. Um, there are thousands of different varieties of grapes in the world, and uh, 
uh, most of the European grapes um, uh, have fairly common ancestors. There are probably 20 or 30 common ancestors that have given rise to many of the other newer varieties that uh, have come along in the last few hundred years. Um, there are some new ones still being developed today. Uh, so when you see those names, it simply refers to different varieties of grapes that are available out there. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary, this call comes from the Flathead area, uh, Polson to be specific. Uh, do they have any disease problems in grapes? And Bob, you can jump in too. Yeah, I mean, there are. I, I'm not aware of any that are particularly serious in Montana. Um, little powdery mildew uh, and probably agrobacterium crown gall. I don't know that we get botrytis issues in the clusters at all. How about you, Bob? Um, we, we grew some Riesling uh, for a few years and had to bury it to get the fruit. And we had some botrytis in the, in the Riesling, um, but I don't really see it on other grapes. I'd forgotten about crown gall. It's our most troublesome disease here. And for vines that get winter damage of any sort or physical damage from a lawnmower or anything like that, uh, crown gall can set in pretty easily. Uh, uh, we've had a, a fair amount of trouble with, uh, with the Marquette uh, variety. Um, and unfortunately, it's not very treatable. The treatment for crown gall is to cut it back below the, the galled portion, uh, cut that trunk out entirely, and train up some new ones. And usually you can uh, continue with a fairly healthy vine unless it just gets completely infested. Um, and we have discovered here at our place that uh, uh, leaf phylloxera was a, a big deal uh, last year. Um, and the first time we ever saw any significant amount of powdery mildew. So if you have, if you live in a spot in Montana where you get quite a bit of relative humidity, um, those diseases are going to be higher. If you live where there isn't much relative humidity, um, uh, disease incidence seems to be much, much less. Oh, Bob, we lived in New York for several years and I really love Botrytis size wine. And I think most of the New York wines at least the yes. whites get a lot of botrytis in them. <laughs> ice wines. Yep. I love ice wines. Yeah, yeah, ice wines are very, very good. Uh, Abby, a uh, Facebook question. This person was planning on aerating and overseeding his lawn here in Bozeman. Uh, now they've got the snow, and they've been told the best time to do that is in the fall. Should they wait till spring to do it now? Well, um, yes. Uh, so one thing, you can aerate your lawn any time of the year as long as the ground's not frozen and as long as the ground isn't too dry from drought. Um, it's, fall is a good time to do it because it's, it's adding that oxygen into the soil so that the roots can continue to proliferate. Um, but definitely, um, since you won't be able to get to the ground at this point, waiting until the spring is good. Um, for seeding, spring will work uh, as well. Uh, fall is the best time to seed for um, cool season grasses, which is most of what we grow in Montana, Kentucky bluegrass specifically. Um, but the spring will work well as, as well. So as soon as you have um, some, um, you know, slightly warmer um, spring weather or no snow cover, you can add that seed and, um, yeah. So you should, spring should work just fine for doing that. Okay, thanks, Abby. Uh, Mary, this person from Malta watched the program on canola last week and is curious, are there any serious diseases that uh, canola growers should be concerned about? There are several serious diseases of canola. Um, you can just look up north to our Canadian counterparts and they have quite a few. Um, I, black leg is one. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the names. I don't deal with them every day. Um, there's a number of leaf spots, alternaria. Um, and then there's a change in oh, the, uh, I will, I'll skip that one, but there's a bunch of fact sheets. My <laughs> yeah. memory is not very good tonight, but a uh, bunch of fact sheets in Canada and North Dakota has a really nice um, book actually on canola diseases, and I'd recommend them getting that. You know, and let's talk a little bit about rotation. Um, if you grow canola in 2020, 
How long should you wait probably before you plan it? It's probably just like pulses, you know, three, four years. Yep. Give it a good break. Okay. Good question. Good answer. Um, Bob, a Facebook question. Um, came from Polson. Are there any other Montana fruits that make good wines? That is a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, we make uh, about 30 different wines at our winery every year. And uh, about half of them, maybe a little more than half of them are uh, made with different fruits. Uh, Carmine Jewel Cherry, which was developed by the University of Saskatchewan, is hardy to 50 below, grows in either alkaline or acid soil, so it'll grow darn near anywhere. Uh, it's a shrub rather than a tree, so it's easy to manage. Um, however, the birds do love it. Um, Saskatchewan also developed uh, the Haskap fruit, which is an edible honeysuckle. It's sometimes referred to as honeyberries, uh, out in Oregon and Washington area especially. Uh, we were the first winery in the entire U.S. to make wine out of uh, Haskaps. Um, we make wine out of apples, pears, cherries, plums, uh, red raspberries, yellow raspberries, choke cherries, yellow choke cherries, red currants, black currants, rose hips. What have I left out? Rhubarb. Uh, you, you name it, if it looks like a fruit and acts like a fruit and it will grow here, we will ferment it. Bob, I have to ask you, how hard is it to, to sell your wines? Can you get shelf space in stores? I, I see Montana wines around Bozeman. I don't think I've seen anything from Tongue River Winery. How hard is it, is it to get shelf space? You know, it's, there are a couple of things that, that are important. One is you, you better be making damn good wine. Uh, if, if you haven't perfected uh, your techniques so that you're turning out a, a good, good quality product, all you need is uh, a few rumors going around that your wine isn't worth drinking and you're going to have a really big problem with shelf space. Um, something that helps is to enter competitions. And let's be honest, competitions do not measure the quality of the wine. They measure the... Uh, uh, perspective and attitudes of the particular judges that happen to be at that comp, uh, competition. Our best-selling wine is rhubarb wine. It hasn't even won a bronze medal. Um, but a lot of our wines have won gold and silver medals. Uh, a couple of them won double gold medals. We are not shy at all uh, about promoting that information. If you don't have the guts to brag about the quality of your products, you shouldn't be in the business. Uh, it's not bragging about me. It's bragging about how good the wine is, and that's the difference. Um, it helps if you can meet with uh, uh, the wine manager of a store personally, and uh, uh, we hope to start doing more of that. Most of our wine is sold in southeast Montana because it's the easiest place for us to, to get it distributed. Uh, and our local distributor sells a lot of wine in eastern Montana. Uh, we do ship wine to a half a dozen retailers in other parts of the state. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the largest retail purchasers in Montana of our wines is in, of all places, Grass Range, Montana. There is nothing in Grass Range, Montana. Maybe 15 houses and three retail establishments, and that's it. But uh, A little bigger Earth than that. <laughs> uh, a little bigger. Uh, the old American Grass Range uh, sells an awful lot of wine for us. And, you know, if the if the retailer contact person is excited about your product, they will find room on the shelf. Uh, we haven't pushed real hard um, in the western part of the state uh, simply because it's farther distance and we have to arrange for somehow getting it out there. So uh, we do sell wine in, in Haver and Lewistown and uh, a couple of other stores, Helena. Uh, but we'd like to have our wines in the western part of the state too. Okay. I have a question, Bob. Um, do you so does the Wine Growers Association have lists of um, wineries that are producing the wine and bottling it in Montana, as opposed to people that are bringing in wine from other states? No, we do not have an official list of those who are actually making wine. 
which as far as I'm concerned, is what the definition of a winery should be. Uh, and those who are in effect acting like wine taverns, uh, where they can buy wine from as many different wineries across the country as they want, put their label on it, call it their wine. Um, and uh, to me, that's not a winery. Uh, if you're a brewery, you should be making beer. If you're a distillery, you should be making distilled product. Um, but uh, uh, most of us who are genuine bonded wineries who actually crush and ferment fruit, we know who some of those other wineries are, and some of them are very successful in uh, selling their products, uh, but it's not the same thing as making a genuine Montana product. Okay, well so said. So what would you, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Abby. I was gonna say, um, what would you recommend to someone who wants to make sure that they're supporting local wineries um, in Montana uh, who are producing that fruit? A couple of things, um, ask the winery, if this wine is actually made there, um, be specific. Uh, do you ferment it here? Um, you can put made on Mon made in Montana on on wine bottles. If the only thing you do is you age it for a little while, bottle it and label it. Well, that really stretches the definition of made or produced. But uh, so ask: Is it fermented here, or are you bringing in finished wine? Uh, secondly, looking forward to the future, um, our winery uh, uh, registered the, uh, the term totally Montanan. Uh, we've sold a few of our varieties of wines with the totally Montanan brand. Um, uh, we own the totally Montanan website. Uh, we are strongly considering donating our totally Montanan brand slash name either directly through the Department of Commerce as an adjunct to Made in Montana uh, or doing it within our organization. And only those wineries that meet the proper criteria for something actually made in Montana will be allowed to use that. Um, we have a lot of customers that stop at our winery that are specifically looking for a genuine Montana product. I can remember visiting a Native American gift store in um, Arizona years ago and I turned over one of the little items they were say selling and on the bottom it had a little sticker that said made in Hong Kong. Well, um, if you want it to be a Montana product, ask. Okay, thank you. Good point. Uh, Stephen, are there any, uh, from Missoula, are there any rodenticides that pose less of a risk for secondary spread or infections or damage. You might let people know what that means, secondary effects. Sure. Well, whenever, yeah, that's referring to what's called primary poisoning and secondary poisoning. So primary poisoning is the, is the mouse eating the toxicant directly. That's primary poisoning. Secondary poisoning is a cat or an owl or a hawk eating the mouse that ate the poison. That's secondary poisoning. So when you're wanting to reduce the risk of secondary poisoning, you'd want to use those first generation anticoagulants I was referring to. That's the warfarin, diphasinone, chlorofacinone. Or you can use another product called zinc phosphide. Uh, if it, in, according to all, always use them by the label, of course, but zinc phosphide has a minimal to almost zero secondary poisoning hazard. The first generation anticoagulants have a lower secondary ha secondary hazard as a compared to the second generation anticoagulants so if you're focusing your attention on the pri on the first generation anticoagulants chlorofacinone warfarin and diphasinone you are using a safer product okay for secondary poisoning you know speaking of pests like that bob i know you have some problems with birds any other and rabbits any other uh pest problems vertebrate pest problems that you have out in Miles City? Uh, of course, deer. And if you don't put up deer fencing, you're just asking for trouble. Um, and there are all kinds of different fencing situations out there. Uh, we use black polypropylene fencing. Uh, it's readily available on the internet. Um, uh, and uh, we've had some up for 15 years. Uh, we've had to repair it a couple of times, but 
Um, it works out really well. It's lightweight. It's easy to manage. You can open it up and to back and pick up in wherever you want. Uh, so it's much easier to use than a chain link fence or a, uh, I've tried electric, uh, with no success. Um, the, uh, uh, the deer will crawl through it anyway, if they want to badly enough. So some kind of a mesh fence is really a great way to go. Um, birds, uh, have been a big problem. We use full overhead netting. Um, if you look at the background on our picture, uh, right now, you can see the netting, um, uh, along the edge of the row. Uh, we form a, a ceiling and four walls. Um, so that netting is about nine and a half to 10 feet above the ground, uh, far away from the grapes. We tried netting row over row, like most, uh, vineyards do and found that brown thrashers and robins would land on the net and bounce until they got close enough. And then they would pack right through the netting and get the fruit. Um, with the netting situation we use now, uh, they can't get within four or five feet of the fruit. And after a, a few days of trying, they, they don't bother coming back. How, um, long, how long is that netting lasting for you with the UV rays? How, how long is it lasting for you? We've had some of it up 15 years and it's wow. still doing just fine. Okay. Um, we don't take it down in the winter. We just pull it back to the edge of the row, mm -hmm. uh, spiral wrap, uh, uh, three sixteenths rope around it to kind of bunch it up and, uh, minimize the snow load. And, uh, it works out pretty well. Okay. Takes about three days. Uh, I would say it takes about one day, uh, per acre, uh, to cover it. Okay. And in the long run, it's no more expensive than row by row netting. It actually uses a lot less netting, but it takes more poles. You need to have tall poles. Right, right. Um, uh, raccoons, uh, a couple of years ago, we lost two or 300 pounds of grapes in one night. Um, and we could see that they were being pulled off from the top of the vine, not the bottom. Uh, we have skunks that will come along and eat fruit that they can get close to, uh, especially on, uh, uh, like sand cherries where uh, they're not high off the ground and they'll eat them. You can find skunk, uh, uh, scats all over the place. Um, but, uh, skunks don't climb. So, uh, when we started having this problem, I set out a live trap and last year, uh, I trapped three, uh, raccoons and shot them this year. I got three more. And uh, we've had no problems with them in the vineyard uh, since then. So we'll set out the trap every year and get rid of the ones that are coming around to cause a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary uh, from Manhattan. They have large masses at the base of their cabbage and tomatoes this year. Anything they need to be worried about? Any idea what it might be? It's probably agrobacterium or crown gall, um, which enters usually through wounding, which um, I don't know what happened. Um, could have been hail. It could have, you know, just never know. Yeah. Uh, and it won't hurt them, and it's soil borne. So if they want to rotate out dicot crops for a while, probably help. Yeah, but with damage, mm -hmm. it'll probably be back. Yeah. Uh, Abby, a Facebook question. Uh, this person forgot to add mulch to their perennial beds before the snow. What can they do now? So that is a good question. 